but so then it won't take a long time. Okay. I, okay. I said, go ahead yeah. and let people in. Thank you. Yes. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, thanks a lot for agreeing to do the lunchtime seminar, Dan. This is a really um, long running seminar. As everyone knows, the seminar has probably <laughs> been going since the 19th. 40s or maybe even earlier when Manta first started here in Nebraska and what was it 1925 or 1926 yeah and so I've been lucky to uh, been able to be able to take over uh, running the seminar since Dr. Janavi and Drs. Nickel retired and then also Mary Lou so I'm going to just quickly introduce Dan now Dan um, got his undergraduate degree from the University of Nebraska Lincoln also got his master's here and then he went off to work with Robin Overstreet at um, Gulf Coast Research Lab. And then we can follow his trajectory by looking up his CV, which is quite <laughs> heavy. So I'm going to go ahead and let uh, Dan go here. This is kind of a, a follow-up talk from uh, the talk that Sal Augusta gave last week. And so this is kind of a really nice um, movement from Sal's talk into the idea of paradigm shifts. So Dan, I'm gonna go ahead and just let you take it. I think that everybody's everything's looking good. As people come into the seminar, we will let them in as soon as we can. And thanks Dan for being here. If if um, any if you have any questions, just blab, you know, just go ahead and fire at us. If we lose connection somehow, we'll try valiantly to get it back. Yes. <laughs> thanks a lot. Let's go. Super. Thanks, Scott. Um <clears throat> yeah they the um uh, the, the stimulus for this particular talk, and this is not a, this is just sort of meandering around a little bit, um, was that the, as, as Sal said in his seminar last week, um, since the Stockholm paradigm is really based on Darwinian principles, and since the evidence supporting the Stockholm paradigm is so widespread and ubiquitous, uh, there is, you know, there's a question of why it's not being accepted more readily. And uh, of course, most of the discussions about why changes in ideas, whether they be political ideas or scientific ideas, why that's so difficult to achieve, most of that's associated with language that's very aggressive and, and combative and talking about winners and losers and you know, who wins and who overcomes and this sort of thing. And because Sal and I have been very interested in Darwinism as a theory of conflict resolution rather than just a theory of conflict, then I thought that, that I, you know, that sort of got us thinking about what I'm going to talk about today. And as well, uh, this is a little bit of an homage to David Hall, who unfortunately is no longer with us, uh, but for reasons that we'll, we'll see very shortly. Um, so, first of all, why is it important to even worry about paradigms in science? And the reason for this is that, from our perspective, is that paradigms direct funding and human activities through theoretical expectations. A good paradigm allows us to get a, a, a us, in, meaning society, whoever funds the researchers, as well as scientists, to get a good return on research time and money. And a bad paradigm in fact, is a waste of time and money. People may do a lot of things that, that actually don't get us anywhere. And it's important to realize that, that the philosophy of science is largely derived from what we call the dead sciences, uh, physics and chemistry, primarily physics. And this has been true ever since the, the Enlightenment, at least in Europe. And yet the subjects of the philosophy of science are living systems. Uh, so this sets up an, an interesting paradox right from the beginning. And our perspective is that a poor understanding of human biology has led to unrealistic idealizations about the practice and goals of science. So that largely what, what uh, physics-based philosophers of science think we ought to be doing and think science should all be about uh, doesn't coincide very well with, with what scientists as human beings actually do especially biologists. Now, fortunately, uh, there is a biological view about philosophy of science. This was published in 1989 by David Hull, uh, Science as a Process, um, which, which was very controversial when it appeared. 
uh, and certainly has not been been given a, a proper, you know, given its due. Uh, unfortunately, mostly because David died uh, way too young. But one example of what David's perspective was, as opposed to traditional philosophy of science, involves this thing called Planck's principle. Planck was a physicist and, and a Nobel Prize winner. And as soon as you win a Nobel Prize in physics, you automatically believe that you are a world authority on everything. So Planck's principle was basically Planck's notion that uh, the way scientific change occurs is that the old guard dies and the young guard takes over. And so in 1978, David Hall and two graduate students did an analysis of the, the, the relationship between the age of people who either accepted or rejected Darwin's theory within the first 10 years after the publication of Origin of Species. And this was published in Science, and they found that there was no correlation at all between the age of acceptance or rejection uh, among scientists uh, uh, thinking about publishing about Darwin's theory. So this is one, one way in which a biological perspective or a human biological perspective uh, can help lead us in a, hopefully in a more productive direction. So um, this is one of my favorite quotations from uh, a, uh, an American mystery writer named Rex Stout, uh, who said in, in a book in 1975, he said, there's only one object on earth that frightens me, and that is a physicist working on a new trick. Um, and I would say in terms of what we're, we're hearing from physicists today with respect to biodiversity and climate change is that our perspective is that the answer is not out there. The answer is not to leave this planet, go to another planet and screw it up as badly as we've screwed this planet up and then keep going from planet to planet. The answer is right here and the solutions are biological. And the solution is based on the one phenomenon that has allowed life to cope with environmental perturbations and has never failed in 5 billion years, and that's Darwinian evolution. So what have we been taught about philosophy and general principles of, of guiding principles of biology? One is that all outcomes should be reducible to a single principle or general law, Newton's laws, for example. And the appearance of complexity in outcomes is the result of incomplete information or bad experiments. Or in the case in which there is, there are some truly complex outcomes of phenomena, the explanations for those must be proportionally complex to the outcomes. So a complicated outcome requires a complicated algorithm to explain it. And furthermore, that, that the notion of emergent properties is, is something that's just made up. It's not, emergent properties are not real. And and yet, we now live in a time when physicists and philosophers of science trained as physicists would have us believe that no one considered complex systems thinking, the alternative to what we've been taught traditionally, until physicists discovered complexity thinking in the late 20th century. And this is simply untrue. This is what happens when you don't pay attention to a broader set of, of uh of intellectual activities than simply the narrow field that you were trained in. So what were we supposed to learn from complex systems theory? What do the physicists believe that, that they taught the world that was new in the late 20th century? The first is that a large diversity of outcomes can be generated from a simple algorithm. That's that emergent properties are actually real in some cases and that nothing that happens in complex systems is the result of a single phenomenon or a single mechanism. And the context in which things happen is always important. So what we say following Alicia Juarero's uh, studies is it's never one thing and it always depends. So based on that, it's fairly easy by looking at the second paragraph of the origin of species that Darwinism was in fact the first complex systems theory. Darwin said there are two factors in evolution, namely the nature of the organism and the nature of the conditions. It's never just one thing. The former seems to be much more important. That is, 
the nature of the, the organism is more important than the nature of condition. So that the two different factors that are at work here are not symmetrical in terms of their impacts. Nearly similar variations sometimes arise under dissimilar conditions and dissimilar variations arise under similar conditions so that the con context is important. That is, it's never just one thing and it always depends. So here we are, and, and this, is, this is a quote from the sixth edition, but it, it's in the, fifth, the first edition as well. So Darwinism was clearly, or at least uh, as Darwin expressed it in, in his book, it's clearly a complex systems theory a hundred years before physicists figured out that the universe might include complex phenomena. Now, Darwin, as, as most of you know, had two uh, famous visual metaphors. One is the tree of life, and one is, is the, the metaphor of entangled banks. Now, the tree of life metaphor, uh, and, uh, Sal talked about this last week, so I'm, not gonna, I'm just gonna summarize it, is that conflict resolution the tree of life, that is phylogenetic diversification occurs through conflict resolution by ecological fitting and sloppy fitness space, followed by co-accommodation, all reinforced by natural selection. And natural selection in, in, in the origin of species was clearly an emergent property, classical emergent property. When the conditions are stable, organisms exploit local conditions, they become specialized and they accumulate evolutionary potential. When the conditions change, they begin to explore their surroundings, they generalize within the fitness space, and they spend that potential. And that's what drives the emergence of uh, selective diversification. That's the tree of life. The Stockholm paradigm explains how entangled banks occur. It's a phylogenetic conservatism in microhabitat preferences, reproductive interactions, trophic relationships, that is, all lead to ecological fitting and sloppy fitness space at an ecosystem's level, coupled with macroevolutionary shifts from specializing to generalize, generalizing and back as conditions change from pertur perturbed conditions to stable conditions to perturbed conditions. And that, coupled with geographic movements associated with perturbations in the conditions, leads to ecological fitting and sloppy fitness space, oscillations in functional connections, and taxon pulses leading to uh, uh, isolation and, and uh, diversification of species within ecosystems. And the sum total of this is a diversified uh, set of ecosystems on the planet at any one time. Now, why is the Stockholm paradigm, why do we call the Stockholm paradigm a paradigm? Okay, because each part of the Stockholm paradigm is completely commensurate with Darwinian principles. So by that criterion and following some, some of the, the ideas of people like Thomas Kuhn, that would say, well, the Stockholm paradigm is just a subset of Darwinism. However, the sum of the parts, the way these different pieces of Darwinian principles are put together as a, is essentially as a flow is incommensurate with previous efforts based on trying to generate entangled banks from only one of those principles. So we have people who try to generate entangled banks just from biogeography, uh, just from species interactions, just from speciation. And um, Deborah McLennan and I talked about this in our 2002 book, where we talked about the problems of evolutionary biology dealing with discussions of adaptive radiations where the, there's, there's been no way to distinguish between radiations of adaptations and radiations of species. And the Stockholm paradigm resolves that, that problem by showing how both of these things are all part of a more general set of principles. So in that sense, the Stockholm paradigm can be called a paradigm because as a whole, it's incommensurate with any other theory that's been proposed previously, even though all the individual parts are commensurate with previous ideas. So this means that Thomas Kuhn was not completely wrong 
uh, as, as if you read David's book, you'll see that there are some more technical areas uh, where David uh, uh, critiques Kuhn's work. Uh, so to count as a paradigm for Kuhn, there must be incommensurability. And the, but the Stockholm paradigm shows that incommensurability is more complex than Kuhn imagined. It's not A versus B, and we have to decide whether A or B is correct. And as well, uh, uh, what we find is the paradigm shifts are not just simple matters of the old guard dying and the new guard taking over. Uh, the content and cooperation among scientists matter more than age and conflict. And that was the primary point that David made in his book, that successful scientists are scientists who are able to put together cooperative groups of people to promote a particular idea, rather than people who fight with each other and ultimately one person wins and everybody else loses. So even though we, we, we have this expression that we should keep the tried and true and, and conservative politicians around the world always emphasize that we should keep to the tried and true path. But the, the reality is that human beings, including scientists, so often keep to what we call the tried and untrue. And the reason for that is because letting go of something, even if it's wrong, is a complex human phenomenon. It is a complex biological phenomenon. And this was first codified by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in 1969 in her book on death and dying, in which she talked about the, the, not the process of dying, but the process of grieving for someone who has died. That is, how do human beings cope with the loss of another human being? And the idea that, that we're playing around with now is, is thinking of an old paradigm as analogous to uh, someone who has died and, and how difficult it is to let go of that, even if you recognize that the person is actually dead. And Kula Ross recognized five stages of, of grieving, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And of course, it's more complicated than that. Not everybody goes through all these stages and, and uh, not everybody spends time in all those stages equally and, and so on. But in general, this is the, the, the beginning framework, let's say. So denial, which biologists could also call displacement behavior, uh, is characterized in the, in the context of dealing with uh, letting go of an old paradigm Denial manifests itself in people who say there are no problems with the old paradigm and there is no alternative being proposed because I choose to believe that there's no alternative being proposed. Therefore, I don't need to read any published literature about any new ideas, even if they support some of my old ideas. And this is intended to marginalize in innovators out of existence. This is a way to try to ignore people who publish new ideas in a way that will make those new ideas go away. Now, most scientists never get beyond this stage because it took them too much effort to learn the old paradigm when they were in graduate school. And they simply don't wanna mess around with something new. Now, here's an example of denial in action. Uh, this is uh, actually from, from uh, a, a whiteboard in, in Walter's lab in Curitiba. This is the phylogeny of gophers, the phylogeny of lice infecting those gophers. This is what, uh, from what has been called the classic case of co-speciation. Every one of the X's on the left and every one of those red circles indicates places in which there is evidence from the author's own publication that there was no co-speciation going on. And yet this has been published and republished and republished as the classic case of co-speciation. This is a primary example of denial. And this is the, the scientific literature is full of things like this. So the next stage is anger. And we and biologists can also call this avoidance behavior uh, or uh, more, more, more pragmatically kill the messenger. Uh, and this is one of my favorite quotes by one of my favorite philosophers, Gloria Steinem. The truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. So it's a very natural thing. Human beings are really pissed off when they have to confront a new idea. Uh, the generalized anger 
in, in dealing with scientific paradigms is what we call the Salieri effect. Um, that is the people were smart enough to recognize that the new idea is good, but they were not smart enough to have come up with it themselves in the first place. And they spend their entire careers being pissed off that they didn't come up with the idea and therefore someone else uh, uh, got more credit uh, than they did. Someone else got a bigger office, a bigger parking space, a bigger pay raise, a bigger you know, pension, whatever. Anger, of course, is also associated with fear. And here's a quote from, from Frank Herbert in one of the, the Dune uh, series from 1985. The person who takes the banal and ordinary and illuminates it in a new way can terrify. Now this in, in fact is how Sal and I see the Stockholm paradigm because all the parts of it are extremely well-known and well-recognized aspects of Darwinism, in some ways, it's banal and ordinary, and we've just illuminated that in a new way. We don't want our ideas changed. We feel threatened by such demands. I already know the important things. And then someone comes along and throws the old ideas away. And people get really angry at that because they're afraid. And we can go back to they're afraid because they're going to have to get over their denial and read some new literature and, and cope with that. Uh, and the manifestation of that kind of anger, we call the Amadeus syndrome. And this is the point at which people, people who are locked into this part of the anger, uh, uh stage, write negative reviews of manuscripts and, and grant proposals and publications, uh, condemning the authors and condemning the articles without citing actual data. They engage in gossip campaignings, impugning the character of the innovators uh, in an attempt to destroy their, their careers. Uh, and people who get into this, this mode, we call it the Amadeus syndrome from the, the, uh, the film Amadeus, um, generally end up wasting a lot of their own time and, and intellectual capital uh, trying to, to hurt somebody else. And recently, uh, this, this uh, uh, um, op-ed piece in Nature has pointed out that this kind of bullying, this kind of a, a personal attack on people with new ideas has in fact become a, uh, an established method for trying to cope with or, or basically for trying to kill off your scientific competitors. Uh, and I would, I would encourage you, it's only a page long, everybody can read that. The next stage is bargaining. And as David, David Hall said in his book, in science, theft is the sincerest form of flattery. Now this is, this is where the Stockholm paradigm is at the moment. That people recognize the, the shortcomings of the old paradigm, they recognize that they're resolved by the new paradigm, but what they want to say is that all this new stuff is really just a modification of the old paradigm. So we can keep saying that, that it's, there's nothing really new here. We're just incorporating it into what we already have. And one of the ways to do that is to publish articles, making up new terms for concepts that are proposed by the originators of the new paradigm, and then use those new terms and say they're part of the old paradigm simply because you say they're part of the old paradigm. Or, we can write articles addressing the new paradigm, but without citing the original sources of the ideas. Or my favorite, which shows up now, is you attack earlier work by the innovators that has been upgraded in later publications by those innovators, but you don't cite the more recent stuff. So someone will attack an article from 1991, but not cite the update from 2002. And it, so then it appears that the innovators, in fact, uh, really didn't have it right. And you've got it, now you've got it right, therefore it's not really a new paradigm. Uh, and these are three examples of, of uh, major uh, summaries of a lot of these new ideas, including the Stockholm paradigm, uh, that are not regularly cited, for example, by people writing about One Health, uh, even though if you read the, the, the One Health articles, you'll realize that those articles have been published subsequent to these books, 
do not cite these books, but do in fact propose that ideas first set out in these books and earlier publications uh, are now viewed as part of a, the new and progressive approach. When bargaining fails, we move into uh, what Kubler-Ross called the depression phase of grieving. Now in, in the scientific literature, this is, this is when you recognize or a person recognizes that reviewers are now asking why I don't include these new ideas in my publications, in my course lectures or my grant proposals. My students begin talking about the new paradigm using the original terminology rather than the made up new terminology that I prefer. And even in the worst case, people at conferences begin asking me if I know the authors of the new paradigm and maybe will I introduce them to, to the, the authors. Now this is most difficult for those who have what, what Ersatmari calls ADS, uh, which he is a, an acronym for what he calls adoration deficit syndrome. That is, if you don't have a coterie of students coming after you, uh, uh, gazing at you adoringly and thinking that you're the smartest person in the world, then you will flip back into anger and, and cycle through all these stages. And then finally, we have acceptance. This is the point at which some understand the new ideas fully. They have eventually read the literature. They begin to cite the relevant literature. They start to use the proper terminology and they join a cooperative group. That is, they join the group that, that proposed the paradigm in the first place and begin improving on it, even if it means joining the group will, will put them in initially in a what they might see as a reduced sociological role within the new paradigm group. But that doesn't mean that they always end up being there. This, in many cases, can be a mechanism by which a person can be part of a, a new group and then come to the, the point of being a leader in that new group, especially, and this is where the Cunian ideas and the Planck's principle ideas come in, especially when the old people who originated the idea kick off. Now, why go through all this with respect to the Stockholm paradigm at this particular point in time? And the reason for this is because Normally, the grieving process, when it's a human being grieving the loss of another human being, the general uh, approach is to say different people grieve for different periods of time, and we should simply allow people to grieve for an indefinite period of time until they've come to acceptance. With respect to scientific paradigms now, especially with respect to climate change, and climate change threat multipliers, we suggest that we should not allow indefinite grieving with respect to paradigm shifts. Uh, and this is, you know, if grieving the loss of an old paradigm explains why people cling to it so long after it's been superseded, after it has died, after it's been shown to be insufficient, why should we not allow them to just grieve for an indefinite period? period of time. And the reason is because we live in very perilous times now. We live in times of existential threat to the survival of, of the biosphere and humanity, especially technological humanity. And we must accelerate the pace at which we move from, oh, I'm sorry about the typo, from, from denial to acceptance, or at least from depression to acceptance, if the best science is to be used in making public policy decisions. And the reason for that is because squabbles over terminology and academic priority, you know, who gets to get the, the credit for all this crap, give the false impression to public policy people that there's no consensus about the scientific facts. So when scientists argue about, well, you know, will it be 3.1 degrees Celsius or will it be 2.9 degrees Celsius? My model's better than your model. You should use my terms rather than someone else's terms. Public policy people look at that and say, the scientists do not agree on anything. Therefore, we don't have to worry about that. And this is important because in general, public policymakers do not have the time or training 
to read and evaluate scientific debates. So they go with what they learned when they were undergraduates or what is most helpful their, to their careers. And that ultimately leads them to adopt policies that are not at the cutting edge of the best science. So for example, the IPCC just suggested today that uh, we're now looking at a 3.1 degree Celsius temperature rise by 2100, when in fact the best scientists are saying that we will be lucky if we're not at seven degrees Celsius by 2100. But this is not 100% accepted by all scientists and it is certainly not what any public policymakers want to say. Therefore, they're going to go to the most optimistic, that is the, uh, the number that it has, in fact, is representative of the greatest degree of denial within the scientific community. And that's what happens if we don't pass through this grieving process as, as rapidly as possible. So if we're going to cope with new paradigms and we wanna to try to make this whole grieving process go faster, the first thing you have to do is not make it personal. Okay, and this is what we call the Barbara McClintock criterion. Barbara McClintock uh, famously said, the most important thing about the work that she did on, on what we call mobile genetic elements now was to know your organism. In other words, make it about, if you're a biologist, make it about your study group. Don't make it about you. Don't make it about other people. Know your organism, make it about your organisms. You must maintain what we call a fire in the belly. You have to be curious, you have to be patient, you have to be persistent, and you have to make a commitment to being curious, patient, and persistent for your entire career, for 30 or 40 or 50 years. You have to not fear success or failure because you're going to experience both. And in that context, you don't have to worry about the fact that people are going to gossip about you and say bad things about you behind your back. There's a reason why they're behind your back and they're not relevant to what you're trying to do. You should cultivate a, an, an aura, a sense of detachment. And that's the key to forming a cooperative group. And this is a, a, a quote from Dorothy Sayers, who's one of my favorite British mystery writers from the classic days. Detachment is a rare vir virtue and very few people find it lovable either in themselves or in others. If you ever find a person who likes you in spite of it, still more because of it, that liking has great value because it's perfectly sincere and because with that person, you will never need to be anything but sincere yourself. So how does this play itself out? Detachment is sometimes thought of as the opposite of empathy. That is, someone who has a scientifically detached perspective on conservation biology is often accused of not caring about life and not caring about the warm and fuzzy animals. But the reality is that detachment is not the opposite of empathy, it's the, it's the opposite of teleology. It's the opposite of saying, we have to find, everything has a reason and we have to find out what that reason is and agree on that before we do anything. Detachment allows you to say, what do we do now without wasting time asking, why do we have to change the way we've been thinking after investing so much time and effort in memorizing the old story? It allows us to get on with things. Detachment also allows you to be insensitive to people who become personally committed to an old paradigm and resist efforts to constantly try to improve it or replacement. It, detachment allows you to just not worry about these things and not waste time worrying about that. Uh, for one thing, it's not gonna work. You're not gonna change those people anyway. And finally, you need as much as possible to be able to laugh a lot. This is one of my favorite uh, online memes. A young artist exhibiting his work for the first time and there's a well-known art critic in attendance. And the art critic says to the young artist, would you like to hear my opinion of your work? And the artist says, yes, please. And the critic says, it's worthless. And the artist says, I know, but let's hear it anyway. And this makes me 
the first time I ran into this was at the International Congress in my own career, was the, at the International Congress of Parasitology in Brisbane, Australia in 1986, when I gave a talk uh, about some of the early, early efforts in phylogenetic analysis with, with parasitic worms. And at the end of my talk, a, a famous British uh, uh, parasitologist named H.H. H. Williams stood up, turned his back to me, and then lectured the audience about what a waste of time and what horrible science all this phylogenetic stuff was. And he ended up with an amusing anecdote comparing my published work to use toilet paper. Um, and at the end, and I just, I didn't respond. I just, there's nothing to respond, respond to when something like that happens. And at the end of the session, then, as I was walking out, some of my friends came up to me and said, why didn't you jump on him? Why didn't you, you know, get really angry back at him and really go at him? And I said, there's no point to that. And then the person who is the most important person in my entire professional life, Mary Lou Pritchard, came up to me and she patted me on the arm and she laughed and she said, that was exactly the right thing to do. And that taught me a lot. It's difficult to laugh in the face of people who are saying things about you that are not true. But if you understand that the reason they're saying those things is because they're actually grieving for the loss of what they had invested a lot of time in, then that may help you to laugh a little bit about it in the future. And if we follow these general guidelines, or at least, you know, Sal and Eric and, and Orshi and Valeria and Walter and I try to follow this as much as possible, it's a way to get through these, these difficult times and maintain your focus on the fact that we live in very dangerous times and we really don't have a lot of time to waste on extraneous uh, issues that are not really part of creating a solution to the problems. So, that's kind of that. Thanks very much. Well done, Dan. Thanks. Let's see if we can go back. I had to turn the microphone on so you could hear the rockets clapping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that was very well done, Dan. Thank you very yeah. much. Well, it's 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 uh Thanks to David Hall, and unfortunately, he's not still with us, but um, that was, you know, it's kind of my, my, you know, my little homage to David's memory and maybe, maybe an indication that I finally come to accept the fact that he's no longer with us. Yeah, so this is the book that I, I require yeah, my, right. systematic, very good. Very good. my systematic students to read during the semester. And next semester I'm teaching systematics and they will be reading this book. It's yeah. a it's a significant effort. And it's also one of the most important, important books to read if you're at all interested in how this stuff develops, how philosophy of science develops and how actually the the philosophy of systematics develops. It's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. So Dan, thanks for for bringing it up. And it's something that we think about all the time. Um, and we use, but it's it's an important one. And I I talked to a philosopher the other day. She's teaching in my class just before I teach invertebrate zoology, the same room. And I said, have you seen this book? And she said, I've heard of it, but I've not seen it before. So she said that she's talked to a bunch of her uh, colleagues in the philosophy department, and they're they're familiar with it, too. So it's pretty interesting. So appreciate that very much. Um, so let's have questions. Any questions or comments from out in the world. Um, we had a few comments. Some people said that they were really hoping we're recording this because they can repost it and it is being recorded. Oh, yeah. And I am recording it and I will uh, make it available on the Mantra Lab Facebook page for, for, for one. I've also also put it on the Mantra Lab YouTube page, which we have uh, a YouTube page. And I'll put the links to it on our UNL, hwml.unl.edu. Yeah. Page, so that will be available. And and Sal's Sal's lecture from yet, last week is also it's on the it's on the same site. At the same yeah. site. Yeah. So those are these all all the lectures will be available. So any questions or comments? 
Uh, yeah, I see. <laughs> I see that a few people are here from different places, and uh, I'm interested in um, in when I when I teach my systematics class is to utilize um, some of the ideas of the Stockholm paradigm. Let's see. It says uh, I missed the beginning and wondered if you referred to Hall's book. It was a grad student of Nor I was a grad student of Norm Platnick. So go ahead, Dan. Yes, yeah. I did. And yeah, and so when you see the um, yeah, there it is. When you in fact, this is that book is the the foundation of my perspective on uh, the 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 philosophy of biology and as a as a very human effort. And that was that was one of the things that David really wanted to point out was that, yeah, there are scientific principles here, and there are there are you know high high ideals about weight of evidence and critical experiments and things like that. But fundamentally, a lot of this stuff is about real human beings trying to work through the fact that they have their own human aspirations and feelings. Uh, and at the same time, they're trying to do something uh, relatively objective and, and trying to contribute to um, a relatively objective uh, set of principles. So yeah, you'll, you'll see that if you, if, if you look at the... Um, uh, the recorded version that's online at the Matter Lab site, you'll see that that I mentioned David's book right at the beginning. Excellent. And uh, one of the things that's interesting about this is that not only does it occur, do, do the lack of citations occur um, to people who are famous and, and like you are, Dan, um, but we published a paper um, on ecological um, niche modeling a couple years ago, and we predicted that uh, we would find Echinococcus multilocularis in northern New York. And so three years later, um, people are becoming infected with Echinococcus multilocularis alveolar hydatid disease in northern New York. So of course, um, it was published in The Lancet. And of course, they did not pub they did not cite our papers. It's easy to find our papers because we're using all of yeah, the, right. yeah. the code words for it. And it's they obviously chose to ignore it, which I find incredible because this is not just something that is done to show a new species exists, but this is human health importance and things that we need to have ideas about now to make a difference. And people are actually having to undergo major surgeries with alveolar hydatid disease. And we could have had knowledge about this a long time ago. Anyways, yeah, yeah. it's happening well, this now. Is, yeah, this is how you get if, if you've got disciplinary stovepiping and there's no commitment to uh, uh, cooperation, then you end up with this sort of thing. You end up with clinicians reinventing the wheel that biologists knew about years before. And the more time we waste trying to make it appear that each of these different research groups has done something completely independent, the more time and money we waste that we could be engaged in finding workable solutions to the problems. Um, right, yeah, this just is one, one small reason. Example. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the, the one of the most frustrating things to us has been the fact that at the end of, you know, the COVID pandemic, or, you know, after the end of four or five years of, of thinking about COVID, not a single public health organization on the planet has changed any policies at all with respect to emerging infectious diseases. And as a consequence, uh, some of the diseases that Eric and Walter and I warned about in our 2019 book, such as polio, monkeypox, and avian influenza are now problems. And then the expectation is that if we continue business as usual, we will not Again, we will continue to not see policy changes. And the, and the justification for that will be, there's no consensus in the scientific community. Therefore, we're doing the best we can. Yes. So that's one of the... Uh... I mean, that's just one, one example of a, a practical spinoff of, of people not getting together and, and overcoming these, you know, otherwise very human... Uh, uh, emotions and considerations. Right. 
Um, there was another comment in the comments there. Can you see those comments, Dan? Uh, let it's, me. It's one off my screen for some reason. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, oh, this is. You want me to talk about the 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 person who who mentions that uh, uh, that Maynard Smith wrote a very negative review in Nature of David Hall's book. Oh, right. Uh, Maynard Smith was in denial. I mean, I knew John Maynard Smith, <laughs> wonderful human being, and as well as obviously very significant scientist. But the fact that he could not imagine what 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 John objected to was the way the interactions among taxonomists were portrayed by David and David's assertion that this was not unusual, that it wasn't just taxonomists at that particular point in time, that this is the way, ta the, the way scientists actually interact with each other. And John was such a wonderful human being and had never experienced that in his career, being from a relatively privileged background. Uh, he could not imagine that this could possibly be true. And yes. he thought that David was just making this up and overly dramatizing the situation. Uh, but the reality is that, you know, I was one of the people that, that, that David talks about in the first half of Science as a Process. Uh, he referred to me as the kind of bright young man that pharmaceutical companies send out to convince doctors to buy their products. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's probably exactly how I was in my 30s. And <laughs> um, I I remember in, that in part yes. because of the way the way David described me that helped me decide that, well, maybe, you know, maybe I wanted to try to clean up my act a little bit and not not be that way. But the, but, you know, I experienced many of the things that David talked about firsthand. And I experienced them when I them when I was a young scientist, and it was it was frightening. I mean, we were we were we were convinced we weren't going to get jobs, then we were convinced we weren't going to get tenure, and and in fact, David was right on the money. And my experience is now moving forward into biodiversity studies, science policy arenas. Um, ecology, evolutionary biology, I've never found it to be any different. Yeah. And so in, in all deference to John as, as a wonderful human being, on that particular case, he, he wasn't he wasn't he, he wasn't right. David David was actually more accurate about what was going on. Yeah. So any other comments? That was a, a, an excellent one. But it was uh, a great I mean no that yeah. that's a uh, I, I I don't know the gentleman who who uh, who posted that, but it's a really good point. It's a really good point, and thank you for remembering that review. Yeah. <laughs> yes, excellent. Um, any other comments that you can see, Gabor? I don't have any comments well, on my screen for some reason. Oh, uh, where the chat. Oh, yes, it's not the chat. Sorry. Do that. Go ahead. The, where are we are going to post the recording? The yeah. So the, as as we said, the recordings will be posted on the Mantra Lab Facebook page, which is um, uh, Facebook um, slash Mantra Lab. There will also be this will also be put on the Mantra Lab YouTube page, and I'll put a link pointing to those places on our uh, website, which is hwml.unl.edu. And that one's always up. So we'll have those available. I'll get them done as soon as they get uh, downloaded and turned into uh, a video format uh, from Zoom. <laughs> we have to use Zoom. So nothing happening in uh, in uh, Moscow, Olga. No questions about um, Stockholm paradigm or anything like that from you? I'm just amazed by the, the lecture. So I have no, no particular questions but i have to you know process what i've heard because it's really well it, it it's hard to confess but i feel that i'm also as, as a creature i'm as everyone uh, i feel hard to accept new um, ideas and so on despite it seems like i have to be more open for them and so uh this this talk 
made me think hard about <laughs> concepts and everything and acceptance and, and some new ideas. So it's it's maybe not that pleasant feeling as it was quoted, but it's really important to uh, to stay open and, and encouraged and consistent and everything, you know, to, to, mm, to maintain being a scientist, if you know what I mean. Yeah, to be well, never blinded. never be afraid to ask questions. Um, yeah. My my first dean when I when the first time I became a faculty member it was at the University of British Columbia, and my first dean Cy Finnegan, uh, one of the most important lessons he taught me was, uh, if you ever run into a university administrator who has no sense of humor, be very cautious with that person. Yes, he good said, point. Run, having no. a sense of humor is a real is a real characteristic. And the same thing is if you ask somebody who presents himself or herself as a, an authority figure and you ask them a question and they get angry or they just tell you to go away, then ignore them. They, they should yeah. sit down with you and say, that's an interesting question. And they'll either say, I've heard this question before. And here's what I always say. Maybe that's right. Maybe that's not right. Not right. But this is what I say about that. Or they're going to say, "I've never heard that question before. Let's talk about it." And then everybody learns, and everybody gains from the interaction. Yes, very good. So, any other questions out there in internet land? Thanks, Olga, for your comments and questions. Yes. Um, Olga and I've been working together for almost what a couple two or three years now on uh, her work on pinworms and such. So I know that she has some pretty um, interesting things going on with her with her research there that it's not always easy to get published. So um, something that's to, to keep in mind. Let's see, anything else, Gabor? No, I don't. Hey, Scott? Yes, Sal, go ahead. Uh, I just have a technical question. Maybe I'm missing something. Is there? You said there was a link on the lab webpage to the talks or that's going to be up it's not up yet it's not up yet because uh, okay. i'll make that soon but if you go to our facebook page we've got it okay yeah yeah, yeah. facebook yeah. slash mantra lab okay um, facebook.com slash mantra lab that's up so okay. the other one we'll have soon we have to do some adjustments it's not as easy to fix the the, the web page as it is to do the uh you know internet level four stuff on the facebook page so Yep, no, no problem. But I think you're already up on Facebook. Yeah, well, I, I don't use Facebook, so I don't know if I can get it if I don't have a Facebook uh, account. So I think you can. I think you just type in uh, facebook.com forward slash mantra lab and it should uh, come. But okay, well, that, if it should. doesn't, then uh, yeah, yeah. We just and use and for, since since we have my brilliant young co author and colleague right here right now, yes. I, I'm going to say that uh, we MIT Press just notified us that uh, they've made an agreement for the Chinese translation rights of a Darwinian survival oh, yeah. guide. All that. Very nice. Which is very cool news. Yeah, it's good to have. And we, uh, do they, are they making an audio book of it? I don't know. Uh, they don't, yeah, they so haven't our, told our, us and, and we're not asking. <laughs> our Parasites, the, the Inside Story is now an audio book. Oh, we that's great. Oh, cool. so Excellent. Everybody should get it. And also it's in Korean now. So everybody should get that one. <laughs> Very good. So, I'm not sure if we have anybody uh, from Korea here today, but um, hopefully they'll be in um, soon on one of the recordings. I think we'll go Can ahead and, uh, well, let's see, anything um, else? Um, yeah. Are we good? Can you hear me? Go ahead. Say yes. yes. Yeah. Um, not everybody can get it at Facebook and in some countries it's restricted. So just be aware of that. Uh, good point. All right. Well, yeah, we'll be able point. to have this on YouTube yeah. um, and we can, I think I can go ahead and post the recordings on the Mantle Lab website. I'll put them all in there this semester. So the other thing I, I wanted to invite Dil Rukshan to make comments because you've given some nice mm -hmm. ones in the chat. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Nice to nice to, like to speak up. sort of meet you. Yeah. At a, some point <laughs> in the future, we'll uh, our, maybe our paths will cross. So where uh, are you, uh, Del Rukshan? Where are uh, you? I, I'm actually in Priyanka. Uh, my first name is Rukshan. So a bit like yes. uh, Steve Ferris, uh, who's never known as James. 
yeah, Stephen yeah. Ferris. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm Priyanta. I'm, I, I was a, a grad student of Norman Platnick's. I think the second after Bonnie Bain. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I remember, you know, as young grad students, and we were like pretty clueless about <laughs> most things. Uh, and uh, uh, I remember, um, uh, you know, going to this, um, I guess it was like a kind of like a picnic lunch kind of thing at Norm's place, you know, uh, Norm, the late Norm, great Norm yes. Platnik. Um, and, uh, you know, everybody was kind of like a buzz with, uh, Hull's book, which had just, <laughs> I think, which had just come out. I think it came out in '88, and uh, I guess it was that year. Uh, so this is going back a long time ago, you know. Yes, yeah. yes, I remember. Yeah, uh, because you know, like all these people were in it, basically, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. either explicitly <laughs> named <laughs> or. <laughs> so that was quite, uh, you know, and I mean the the point I made, you, you know, so. Sometimes, you know, I mean, I think I, I really enjoyed, you know, what you had to say and, and uh, because it was, you know, these days one tends to see, um, you know, the, the philosophical kind of aspects of biology, not so, you know, everything is like being done, you know, uh, but but how how those things come about is not so much, you know, it's not so much discussed mm -hmm. or thought about. So, I really enjoyed your talk because uh, I think we were kind of more conscious of that, you know, how things come about. Um, I mean, some some of the, you know, some of the, so I, I refer to TTS, you know, three taxon analysis, which, you know, Norm and, and uh, uh, Gary Nelson, you know, they were the main proponents. And yeah. somehow, you know, that was out of, that seemed a little kind of uh, <laughs> sort of black magic kind of, you know, like it, it, it was not straightforward cladistics. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there was, I think that paper that came out in cladistics, I, you know, this is long, going back long time ago, uh, but it seemed to kind of, uh, you know, oh, that, that's not how we do things. Let's just <laughs> shut it down, kind of. You know that that's yeah. kind of what the message was, because there were like a, a ton of authors, you know, like like signing a petition, basically. Right. Know? Yeah. So, I I so that was different because, of course, Gary was all I, I guess you know somewhat pro probably older than you know Gary and Norm would have been older than many of the signatories to that paper, but um, yeah. So sometimes it, I don't know. I, I kind of I would have liked to have seen how TTS worked out, you know, just right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, you know, yeah. So just, you know, I mean, a lot of us have there. There are all kinds of anecdotes like that. In 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 1986, I was at at the University of British Columbia, and Ed Wiley and I published this book called Evolution is Entropy, and the 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 institute the um, the ecology institute at the University of British Columbia had a, an all hands meeting, in-camera meeting, uh, where they voted on whether or not this, this was, these ideas were going to be allowed. And they, they <laughs> voted that this is wrong and we will, not, we will never uh -huh. mention this again. And then six months later, uh, they, they attempted to keep me from getting tenure. Um, and, and fortunately, they they did not prevail partly because the dean said, you know, take away the five papers on it and the book on entropy, still got a hundred papers in standard scientifically reviewed journals. If the department turns him down for tenure, you're never going to get another faculty position <laughs> because you will be telling us that you have no, you have no idea what you're doing. Um, Good but, to know. You know, everybody, I mean, everybody I know has some kind of story like that. Yeah. See, Walter said, oh, I didn't get it. Can you see what Walter said? Dan? Oh, yeah, this, <laughs> this is, uh, uh, yes, there, there's, this is a nomenclatural thing. The, the, the whether or not the, the, uh, this one major group of, of flatworm parasites should be, should be known as the monogenia or monogenoidea. And, and there are, by the rules of nomenclature and, and some of the linguistic conventions, 
Clearly, it should be monogenoidia, but monogenia it was simply voted upon by a group of, of workers who said, no, we're not going to use this. Well, there's no rules above the level of the family anyway. So, you know, <laughs> you can do what you want if you vote on it, right? So, it was a recognition that uh, Bichowski proposed the uh, monogen yes. should be the class at class level in 1933, right. when we were looking at monogenes as being an order. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Uh, it, it's gone now. There is no, no, no taxon with that name anymore. <laughs> it disappeared. Right, right. Yeah. No, so, I mean, academics have a tendency, to, academics can get really angry about really stupid things. I mean, all of us, you know, who are faculty members have probably been in faculty meetings where somebody got really, really angry because somebody else had a better parking spot or somebody else had a slightly better lab or some, you know, something really, really dumb like that. And there's, there's even a saying in, in English at least that the intensity of academic infighting is inversely proportional to what's at stake. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's good. All right, well, I think we'll end here unless anybody else has a comment. Thank you very much, everyone, for showing up. We will um, figure out what we're going to be talking about next week. I don't have the schedule in front of me, but we will be advertising it on the, the uh, email blast and also on our Facebook page. So thanks, Dan, for being here. Um, and um, thanks, thanks, everybody, everybody for, for putting joining up with us. It. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. See you, Gabor. Adios. Adios, everyone. <laughs> so let's see, let's get out of here. And for everybody.